Derek. All right, welcome to the Wednesday, August 12, 2015 meeting of the Moscow Planning and Zoning Commission. First item on the agenda, approval of the minutes from July 22nd. Move for approval. Thank you, Gregory. I'll, um, I'll second. Okay, we have a second. Let's see, I had various notes, but I'm not sure they were corrections. Oh, on page five of six, first paragraph, ends in for sake of discussion no. comma <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what that means I mean the simplest might be just to strike it but on page four of six do 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 the paragraph that begins Scott Becker third line middle of it he also appointed out that there is an existing utility. <laughs> so I think it's just he also pointed out. Any other observations or corrections? Well, you should be an English teacher. Picky <laughs> <laughs> Good. I just want to show you that I read the document. <laughs> I'm very impressed. <laughs> All right, with that, uh, all in favor of approving the minutes with those notes, say aye. 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 Opposed and abstentions. Aye. Kurt, Deborah, and Rebecca abstaining. Thank you. Correspondence. Anything from staff? Anything from staff this evening? Uh, Bill, last time the floodplain ordinance status, the well, floodplain ordinance work was postponed, I think. That the state hadn't got back to us. Do we have any status update on that? State has not re responded back yet, so they've had the draft for about a little over a month, I think, at this point. And we're hoping okay. that we'll get comments back in the next week or so, so it should be on the agenda for the first meeting in September. Okay, great. Um, and then the other would be just a reminder to commissioners that we are going to do shared readings later this evening, and so this is a call for suggested shared reading topic or shared reading articles that you would like us to think about. And Mike will be back so you can send them to Mike or you can send them to me as the case may be. Uh, Joel, Transportation Commission meeting. The Transportation Commission will be meeting from 4 to 6 tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the agenda for the meeting includes a uh, uh, Discussion of the uh, uh, Greenways Path program, which uh, we've been talking about for Moscow. Uh, discussion of uh, the uh, Walk Your Wheels effort uh, to get bicycles off of the uh, uh, sidewalks in downtown Moscow. Uh, and uh, there will also be discussion of uh, uh, street maintenance costs and uh, uh, the per perennial issue, bicycle parking. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, and that's tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow afternoon. In this room, correct? In this room. Okay. All right, next up, open microphone. This is a time that uh, the commission sets aside where members of the public may speak to the commission regarding matters that are not on the agenda or currently pending before the Planning and Zoning Commission. Any takers? Looks like not. All right. Next up, number six, water conservation draft plan. Nicole Baker. Good um, evening. Yeah, go ahead. And, and I want to say, I had tried to get this on our agenda two weeks ago. We had a fairly full docket. Um, and um, my reasoning then was partly to give it more airtime. There was a public comment period going on. I think this is an interesting topic for us to think about from its planning implications. Um, but I also thought that maybe we could use our TV time here to get a few more people to think about making comments in the public comment period. Public comment period is now ended, and so um, Nicole will probably update us on where the city is going next relative to that. 
But I asked her to abbreviate what I saw was a very uh, lengthy and uh, comprehensive report presented to Public um, Works. Um, no, that was, oh, that was council a, workshop on July. It was a workshop. July first. All right, you have the floor. Okay, so I'll make this as brief as I can. Um, the conservation plan has been uh, something I've been working on for quite a while. There's been a lot of in-house drafts as well as three um, public drafts. Um, the three public drafts were presented to the Sustainable Environment Commission. And so um, based on their feedback, we proceeded. So here is, um, so as um, Nils mentioned, the council workshop got to see, um, it was finally out to the public um, for the public draft three, and that was July 1st. So these slides are taken from that presentation. Um, and here quickly is a look at our water use in the city of Moscow. There's a few things to look at. Um, right here is our PBAC goal. You'll hear me mention this a few times because that is the goal that the city has with the Blue Space and Aquifer Committee. Um, it was started with a groundwater management plan in 1992 where the pumping entities um, for the Grand Ronde Aquifer came together and all came up with voluntary goals to, um, to help our aquifer, um, the fact that our aquifer is declining and to perhaps help that um, preserve the aquifer, conserve it more like. And so here we have the 1% increase that's allowed, 1% uh, allowed increase and to not go over that target annually for our pumping. And then there's a ceiling of 875 million gallons. And this is for the city of Moscow specifically. Here you look at production. Um, that is the yellow line here. And then the purple line here is our five-year moving average. We look at our goals in terms of the moving average to account for fluctuations with climate and um, um, other water use trends. So inside the conservation plan I um, mentioned, our goal is to stay consistent with the 1992 groundwater management plan to um, stay within that 1% annual or below that 1% annual increase and then the ceiling of 125%, which is happens to be 875 million gallons. These numbers were taken from um, data back in the 80s and 90s. So the, the conservation plan is a 10-year plan to um, hopefully be implement with implementation starting in fiscal year 2016. Um, and then there's going to be four, there's four conservation packages discussed and my staff, um, staff recommendation. So within the plan, there's a lot of things to look at. There's cost effectiveness, water savings rankings, and cost rankings. So you have measures and incentives that are considered um, and there's this big long list. And so within this list, what do you do with it? Well, you want to you wanna find out what is cost effective. So what, and essentially more bang for our buck. How much water can we save? And we look at savings in millions of gallons, but also in thousand gallons saved. Appendix C is quite lengthy, and that's all of the data based on assumptions as far as industry standards. So if you're looking at a toilet rebate, who would be eligible, how, and then there's an, you know, a guess as to how many people would participate within that particular um, rebate program. So to figure out which ones are worth looking at, we look at um, the sa water savings rankings. So those rankings are determined um, as a low, medium, and high, as well as a cost ranking, a low, medium, and high. So that would make sense when something has a high savings and a low cost, of course we're going to accept that. If something is a low savings and a high cost, it wouldn't be accepted. And um, it's also important to note that measures and incentives that were that are able to be that we're able we were able to actually put a number on so we were able to quantify those those are the ones that go that went through this screening process some incentives for instance like a billboard we don't have a way to determine how much water is saved from a billboard so the incentives that were harder to quantify those went through a different screening process um, so I do whoops I do want to point out here when you have a low savings and low cost, that wasn't accepted. I mentioned that because that question came up more than once. There was a measure that came in as a very low, um, very low cost, but it also didn't have a, you know, didn't perform well with the water savings. Um, so quickly, the packages we looked at four different packages. The first package is package A. 
That is the existing conservation program that the city has already been actively um, participating in. It went back as far as 2005 with the device program and it's expanded even into the Wisecape program and other outreach. So this package A, um, the existing program that you see here, this number only, re um, only refers to the device program. Again, measures that we can put a number on. So this does not include the money we, to, we spend in the schools going doing public outreach. Um, we go to 63 different classroom visits, the um, public information and education program. That is not included in these numbers. We essentially just took what could be measured to show you what the savings could be for what we spend. So package A, I also need to mention, is already at full implementation because the city is already active in this program. Um, it is assumed that we're getting, the, um, we're getting the highest amount of water savings possible. We are already at full implementation. Now looking at package B, C, and D, package A is included, so that part of the water savings is considered full implementation. Anything that is added is going to be considered uh, phased in. So just to you know, clarify, you're not going to see those, that full water savings potential until the end of the planning period, which would be 2025. So here's plan, um, package B. Like I mentioned, it already has the existing program and it's adding a toilet rebate program. Um, there's a couple things to look at here. We're talking about single family, multifamily, and the commercial sectors. There's other sectors in the city of Moscow um, like public facilities and industry professionals. Um, those are considered more under uh, incentives program. It's mentioned, but it's not included in the packages that are um, being presented to you this evening and not included in what was considered for a staff recommendation. So we're looking at these different sectors. They're, um, uh, and these are all sectors that actually um, pay a bill in the city of Moscow, these generate revenue for the city of Moscow. And we look at, there's, you wonder, well, there's two different toilet rebates, so there's a $50 and a um, $125 rebate. The difference being the $50 toilet rebate is for homes that are 1994 or, or older could, you know, they have a three or a five gallon per flush toilet, they can get the um, standard of the 1.6 gallon per flush for $50. Now any home that's newer than 94, would already have that standard because that is the plumbing code required by the, you know, the U.S. Department of Energy. So, so already those people would be able to get the high efficiency. Of course, there could be overlap where somebody with an older toilet could certainly go for the high efficiency. But for the sake of the data, um, there was, you know, I did the numbers where I could separate the demographics between the older and the newer homes. Um, you have two toilet rebates allowed per home for the single family. One allowed for the multifamily, so that could easily be, um, if you have a 10 unit complex, that would allow um, 10 toilets, so one per unit. Um, you have four toilet rebates for the commercial customer, and then in addition to the, for the commercial customer, there's a low flow urinal. Um, there's also a landscape guidebook included. Package um, B has an annual cost of $59,000. And again, we were looking at the cost as a phased in e even approach over the 10 years. Same with the water savings over the plan period was the phased in approach at partial implementation over the plan period where your annual savings, you know, coming to year 2025, that's when you're gonna see your better savings. <clears throat> so package C is, is adding on to package B. So. Again, we have the existing conservation program, the toilet rebate, we have the landscape guidebook, and then on top of that, we're gonna add the lawn rebate. That's a lawn rebate of $150 for lawn replacement, one allowed per customer if they remove 300 or more square feet of existing lawn turf and replace it with water efficient landscaping. Um, all three sectors would be eligible. This one is gonna cost a little bit more, and um, but at the same, um, on the same note, it's going to save you more water. Package D is um, package C, so everything we've already um, talked about, plus adding some more, um, so adding a hot water valve rebate. That's where instead of running your water to wait for it to get hot when you're running the shower, this uh, um, 
this apparatus allows it to be hot immediately. Um, autom automatic irrigation audits, so that's when somebody goes out and takes a look at your irrigation system, not for manual, but for automatic to see how efficient it could be and how, how it could be um, more uniform and streamlined to be a more efficient system. You have the waterless urinal for the commercial sector and then the efficient clothes washer rebate. Um, so this one is going to cost, have the annual cost of $110,000 and um, again, you're going to, higher cost comes with saving more water. And I break that down for you a little bit more detailed in a summary here. Here is a look at all the package I just, I just went over. Um, the reason you see, you know, somebody might say, well, can't this be here and move it around? Certainly there's different, um, different ways you could go about looking at these packages. However, I just um, gave careful consideration to build onto the existing one um, based on not only what passed the screening process, but what has also been effective and um, has worked well in other communities. Here's a look at that breakdown of all your different packages, your estimated annual water savings. Now, that, again, that's after full implementation. Your total savings over the plan period. You'll see that that correlates with you know, the 10 years, and this is a little bit less because, again, it was phased in. Your reduction in the year 2025, and it, did it achieve our PBAC goal? And unfortunately, none of the packages um, get us to reach our PBAC goal, but we still think it's a, certainly a worthwhile effort because we are talking about an aquifer that has pressure on it and we can reduce some of that pressure um, and perhaps um, buy us a little bit more time to solve our water issues. And here again is our annual cost, total cost of the, over the plan period, and here's a breakdown. You know, I talk about things in thousand gallons so you can see what the different packages cost over the um, thousand gallons and that can give you a better idea. Um, here is a look at, again, our goals, which is our PBAC 1% with the ceiling of 875 million gallons. Um, I wanted to show what it would be like, what our pumping was um, without con conservation. So I went ahead. This is our actual pumping, the blue line. But what I did with the yellow line is I considered, what if we didn't have this package, what would it be looking like? And so um, that's that estimate there. Um, I consider this as to when our conservation program started because that's when we had a full-time staff person. We had a um, device, pro you know, the device <coughs> giveaway program was in full swing by then. Um, so then you can see here we have the different packages um, and with package D saving the most water and then you have package C in the green and the black is package B and then the blue is the existing um, program. And again, you see that, it, you know, obviously water use isn't going to climb exactly in that linear fashion. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have the ups and downs like the rest of it. But as far as a comparison, we just did a, um, like I said, the even phase in over the 10 years. Um, we could certainly have everybody is on board for this toilet rebate and um, we get a lot of interest at the beginning and then it might plateau after a while. So there might be a variation on how much it's going to cost and those are all these questions that will come, you know, will have to be answered as we progress with this. Um, so my staff recommendation is package C, which again is your um, existing program, your toilet rebate, your landscape guidebook, and your lawn replacement, your lawn replacement program. And the reason, reason package C is my recommendation is um, your going after the two highest water users. So it makes sense to go after, toilets are, the, um, well toilets and the bathroom, um, or excuse me, toilets and your shower are like your two highest water users. We're already targeting your shower, your faucet aerators with our device program. That program already exists. So with your indoor water use, 30% of water goes to flushing toilets, so it makes sense to target our highest indoor water use which would be your toilet. So that include, that's included in package C. In addition, outdoor irrigation in the city of Moscow, I, um, I have a great slide that I normally show that um, shows our pumping, our monthly pumping. And in some months, we more than double. And we can all assume, easily assume that's for outdoor irrigation because 
during the winter months, we're not irrigating. We know that number. We know what people are using for the indoor water use. Anything beyond that, we can say is outdoor water use, and it's, like I said, can be more than double. So this package C would actually target that as well. Um, not to mention, the outdoor water use, we already have a lot of programs that support that. So we already have a lot of information about the Yscape. We already have plantless and planting um, designs. So um, the cities, that would be an easy program to roll over into a bigger program. So there's some other considerations that are not um, looked at at great detail, and these are certainly um, questions that need to be looked at. Um, we have our soft costs are not included in this water conservation plan, nor are the indirect savings. So essentially this conservation plan is, this is how much this toilet rebate is gonna cost you. We know from national averages of how many times a person flushes a toilet <coughs> and how many people live in a home and what our population is in Moscow, I can determine we can save this much water with this many toilets. So that's a pretty straightforward number for you to have that comparison. However, we don't have the numbers of um, what's it going to cost to advertise this? Am I going to need, is this program going to explode and be um, really popular? Am I going to need more labor beyond me? Um, I don't know these answers, you know, I don't know the answers to these questions, but I do need to mention that they're not calculated in that number. As well as the indirect savings are not included. So if you want to look at, I had time to get the actual, um, and I was told this number could be a little bit different, but not a lot for when we're pumping our water with our wells and treating that water and sending that water out into our system, that cost could potentially have a significant amount of savings if we're not pumping that water. There's also an additional savings um, from if we're not treating the water. So if you're flushing your toilet with less water, there's theoretically less water we're being treated at the wastewater treatment plant. I don't have that number. Um, again, it's not some, it's something that we certainly need to look at. Um, but on the same notion, you, you know, it's, it's a complex, it's complex to look at in the sense that um, dealing with wastewater treatment plant, if we're doubling our water use in the summer, a lot, you know, that, that increase in water pumping is never making it to the wastewater treatment plant. It's going on people's lawns. So, um, you know, that can easily be calculated. But these are things that we need to look at. Um, where we're at now is um, the public comment period did end August 7th. I haven't um, reviewed these comments, but my supervisor and myself will, you know, look at all these comments and those considerations will be made. Um, and so essentially that's the next step is to get together and find out, you know, find out what the public has said and evaluate that and progress from, you know, from that point. Thank you. Is that, did I make it? Oh, dang it. I went over one minute. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Um, commissioners, questions, comments for Nicole? Yeah, Nicole, I wasn't sure in the, um, in the slides that showed what the different conservation plans would do, what the, what the compared to is. So if, um, if for example, these, these plans were all fully or even mostly effective, what mm -hmm. would the savings be? Um, would, that, would that hit the... Right there. Is that what you're asking? Um, I went through it so quick, you couldn't probably okay. really I read it. I wasn't, sure if, <laughs> I wasn't sure exactly what those numbers meant there. So, so yeah. these numbers meant, this means at full implementation, so year 2025. Again, I mentioned this phased-in approach because you're not having everybody, you know, all the toilet rebates don't go out that first year. Mm -hmm. So. Um, after full implementation, it is, um, that is our potential water savings. Now remember, these um, assumptions are simply assumptions. So based on industry standards, I know that your average water conservation plan says about 75% of the population would be on board with a toilet rebate. So, you know, maybe one year we have, you know, 75% interested in the next year we have 10. You know, there's going to be variations. So these are really, you know, best estimates based on the research I've done and what other um, professionals have done in the field. And again, they are, you know, your best guess as far as how many people are going to pull out their lawn. For instance, that's a lower participation rate. Mm -hmm. 
um, more at around a 10% participation rate. So um, based on that and based on how popular it is, those numbers could certainly, you know, we're talking about this would be the total amount of savings for the 10 years, but after year, you know, 2025, you're at the higher implementation level of savings, so this number after 10 years would be higher, in theory. So does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, did any of the analysis look at the reduction in usage based on an increased an increased cost to the consumer? As if water rates would not right. have? Right. It has been shown that when you have an increase in water rates that um, typically there's a drop and then there, my understanding is the market usually absorbs that. So eventually, you know, like with gas prices, everybody's like, oh, I can't, I'm going to start riding my bike more. But um, that, that would, that's something I've heard a lot. Um, I know when we implemented the tiered rates, um, that was October 2005. Is I believe when the tiered rates came into play, and you know we, you know I think we saw a little bit of a reduction with that. So certainly higher rates. Um, I can't say I I can't say what kind of uh, effect that would have, but I can't say I I would think it would have some, you know. So. And then does that reduction in demand? Did you you know factor in for the the background growth too that? Will be oh going yes, on. sorry. Yeah, okay. that, that was another slide I didn't have in there, but um, okay. it's assumed that the growth rate is a 1.42 percent. That is um, based on the um, HDR 2012 um, water system plan, yeah. okay. and I do believe that is a standard. And now that could be, I've been, it's been mentioned that might be on the high side, but yeah, I, I kind of think. Mm -hmm. It's been our historical average, but since 2000, we've seen a little bit of a decline, but you're talking about two-tenths of a percent. Okay. Difference. I had a feeling you could chime in yeah. on that one, so thank you. <laughs> else? The thought is that the city might engage in one of these plans soon. Is that Yes. Right? Yes, yes, sir. Right. Yes. And as... Uh, People who have been ahead of the power curve, I'm just, uh, you know, there's little rebates for, uh, you know, the toilet or various kinds of uh, landscape uh, issues. And one wonders, uh, 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 what if uh, Family X already changed out all their toilets uh, six months before we get into this plan? and uh, did a wonderful job of zero scaping or something. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wondered how you've uh, sensed that, the, that issue. Uh -huh. In other words, uh, should we uh, just use, uh, should we be profligate uh, for the next few months until we get the plan so that we can take advantage of it? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> um, it is, yeah, I do. And that is considered, um, again, Appendix C is, um, a lot of answers are in Appendix C, and Appendix C again talks about our participation, which also includes those that are eligible. So there are those assumptions of the people that have already done it, and that they're taken out of that eligible equation. So these this these numbers essentially are okay. Who has for the toilet? Let's say who has an inefficient toilet? Uh, well, who has a toilet first off, and then who has an inefficient one? And of those people that have an inefficient toilet how many will participate. So it does consider that not all po part of the population are eligible because of the fact that they may have already changed that out. Older homes, for instance. Whereas we can say for newer homes, some might already have the high efficiency toilet as well. But we know they already have the industry, you know, the, the plumbing code standard of the 1.6. So since 94. Did that? Well, I just yeah. It's a, kind of a silly question, but you know, it, it, uh, it as we worried about our water for the last 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. I mean, various people have already um, mm -hmm. tried to do things. You can see certain uh, uh, yards that 
you know, the history is that uh, we build our nation uh, with thinking green grass is wonderful. And I think uh, in due time we're going to realize that that wasn't such a great, uh, that was a concept that's uh, past its, sure. its mark. You know, and it, and it does include what we call free riders. Those are people that would do it anyway. So you, you, you're restoring your home, you're like, I'm going to throw in these lower flow toilets. Well, I'm going to wait and do the toilet rebate. In fact, I just got a call yesterday of um, somebody asking, hey, do you have, I'm going to change my toilet. Do you have a rebate? And I said, well, not yet. We're looking into it. So that would be somebody that might hold off in a couple of months to do it. You know, so the, these numbers also consider the free riders as well, those that take advantage of the program, but it doesn't necessarily motivate them to do that take them, you know, do the measure, they were already going to do it. You get extra merit in heaven if you do it before the rebate program. <laughs> 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 you get an attaboy, but no rebate. That's it. Right. <laughs> um, one of the things I found interesting on this slide was the very bottom row. Easy. The, the diminishing returns of, for every, every plan, we're putting more money in and saving marginally, the, the, the lowest hanging fruit was already picked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Bill and I had a side conversation by email, and I wanted to explore, um, and, and he was helpful in that, thinking about, was it a year, a little bit more ago, we read, as part of our shared readings, the um, phase two surface water Mm, something plan. Feasibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that had all sorts of pump water from Dvorak and pump water from um, the snake and get it from up by potlatch and get it up on this side of the mountain or that side of the mountain or whatever. And what struck me was the question, how do those compare in costs to these costs? My initial thought was that conservation is cheaper. Mm -hmm. Any amount of conservation is cheaper than new production. I mean, other than drilling wells, which we know is fairly cheap, but is a limited capacity. Bill, do you, can you help us out with any, can you pull up that last thing that you, maybe, it, <clears throat> ideal if you could put it on the screen, but. Let me see if I can do that. Okay. Go ahead and keep talking. I'll, I'll keep talking. I'll, I'll go along a different, um, so the other thing I was thinking about, um, okay, we're going to get a thumb drive or something. Um, I guess it's kind of a, a political question here, which it ends up being a question that impacts, I think, our thinking as a planning body, um, which is, None of the, the, the stated effort here was to develop a conservation plan that helped us meet our groundwater management goal. And none of them do. Mm -hmm. And none of them do. They help, but none of them do. How does the council, I wish John were here, how does the council think about adopting a plan going into it knowing it doesn't <laughs> meet its goal? Mm -hmm. um, okay, Bill, so you got that up. <clears throat> so these, these were the kind of the finalist list of projects, whether it was wastewater reuse, uh, all the way down to uh, surface water diversions on either uh, Paradise Creek or the South Fork of the Palouse River and doing active um, aquifer storage and recovery. And so this is in really descending overall um, construction cost on a um, per acre foot yield. So these are just the project descriptions. This is the annual yield in million gallons. So if, uh, as you may recall, the PVAC goal was 875 million gallons. That gives you some context of uh, going from the Snake River is 72, 7,270 million gallons. So that's, you know, almost eight times, I guess, what we're currently um, as the PVAC limit. So it kind of gives you a range of uh, annual yield estimates, construction costs for those I individual projects ranging from maybe 1.2 million on the small side for the Paradise Creek South Fork diversion, um, up to maybe 149 million for the Door Shack Reservoir Pipeline. 
and so that was kind of the range of cost of projects. These are actually sorted in descending cost per acre foot yield annually. Uh, so again, the Paradise Creek diversion is lowest cost, and the wastewater um, from a uh, per acre foot is the highest cost. You can then sh um, ignore this one. Uh, that's just taking that um, acre construction divided by the acre feet to get a cost per well cost per thousand gallons. If we were to take this construction cost and assume a 30-year bond at a 3%, this is the annual debt service. And if you assumed 5% of construction costs for annual operation expenses, then you get to a total annual operation cost for those options. And then you can convert that cost into the acre feet of yield or for comparisons to the water conservation to the per thousand gallon cost. So if you look at the lowest cost, and the one thing that I would note, I think, in the study that was done for this, these were just construction costs. Actual land acquisition was not included because that was undefined, but the construction could be estimated. So there is a little bit of a, an item there that's not included in the cost. But you're, you're as low as 36 cents per thousand gallons. Um, so the first three options here are probably in the ballpark of the conservation numbers, because at least somewhat kind of in, in the range. As you move up to the door shack and above, then you're getting into much higher cost options, with the highest being um, wastewater. So it's direct wastewater treatment plant treatment, put it back into the potable water system, had the highest per thousand gallon cost. Um, and so, and, and that's because it just has a very low yield potential. So it's only, it's a very small amount for a very high cost annually. And so, um, and this is just a back of the envelope. Operation, operational cost had not been studied or, or determined on these. I was just taking 5% of construction as kind of a, a ballpark number. Um, the debt service is easy enough, but, um, and that's assuming we're carrying the full cost of construction of these projects. A lot of these, say for example, the, the Snake River reuse or the door shack, because of the quantities of water zones produced, those are regional solutions. Those are Moscow, Pullman, you know, multiple cities that could benefit from, from those solutions. And so in those instances, it's not likely that just the city of Moscow is funding that project. You're likely having some congressional assistance as well as some local assistance, but this assumes we're, we're carrying all of the debt service on the, the cost of that project. Um, so that's just kind of a quick back of the envelope. Did, remind me, did you make this? Did you put this together? This table came out of, I've added the, carried over the next columns, the debt service and the annual operating cost, and then calculating then the cost of an annual operation and debt service for the, you know, 30 years during the debt service period. I just added those rows over. But the, the table, you know, all the way over to the cost per, well, cost per acre feet yield was, I think, the end of the, what was in the report. I just added the cost per thousands, the debt service, the operational total annual cost, and uh, total annual per thousand yield. So, so what was your question again? So, so what's interesting here, if you remember the bottom three of those are $1.99 per thousand, $1.28 and $0.36. And then if we flip back to Nicole's slide, try to do so bad. There. Package D is a dollar seventy one. Mm -hmm. So in theory, there are ways to produce new water that might be on a par with these costs. And I went into it thinking there's no way to produce new water without rates having to jump way up. Um, Lots of caveats in Bill's slide, yeah. but yeah. but maybe it's not exorbitantly different than some of these plans. One of the advantages, which if it gets if we've tightened our belt enough to live with those costs, we might be able to live with switching to a new source, as opposed to say, oh, my water rates skyrocketed when you switch to a new source. From a long-range planning perspective, I think that's kind of interesting mm -hmm. to to know. Bill, can you put your uh, table back up there and see if I can? Okay. Is there anything built into this to account for whether or not that water will even be there over the long haul, as in from <coughs> the sources that are? 
I don't think there's. They only asked that because there there's was been no snowpack this year, and so places that yeah. have water have no water, and yeah. this mm -hmm. seems like it presumes Are you all this. Trying to screen. ask, is there a god? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 it's well, more well, whether or not it's screen. been taken yeah. into account. No, I, I could, get, could we I take get. that kind of water away from? Or what form of precipitation does it come in, and can you still recover it during if it comes in rainfall rather than snow? Mm -hmm. You know, based on the design and the, and the size of the storage reservoirs, that's the. And there were, there was a component of those studies that I believe, if I recall, that did look at the potential the impacts of climate, climate change, change section. and and I think evaluated those impacts as as with these. And I don't think it found mm -hmm. that any predicted changes would make any of these not feasible. And did it take into account that there might be other communities besides this one that are looking at the same thing? And what would be that accumulated de new demand on those sources of water? I don't know that it did. Um, we don't have any large communities in the immediate vicinity, but when you start getting to the, the obviously down to the Snake River or to the Door Shack, there are some other small communities, but, but uh, I don't know that it looked at that regional demand in any detail that I recall. Yeah, that would, that would be my contribution to help lead us off into the weeds is, you know, can we get water rights to use well, that's the Snake whole, River? Yeah, and that's yeah. a whole other discussion about yeah. whether there's even any water rights available in the Snake River yeah. um, and or any of these um, waterways. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a whole, you know, they, they could even get into that level of analysis. This is just the engineering solution of right. could you build it, yeah. what would it yield? Based upon you know historical and predicted future precipitation trends, um, the whole other element of how do you acquire the rights for the surface water diversions has not been answered. Yes. No. So to keep it simple, you've developed the this plan for users in the city that uh, ignores these other bigger outlandish issues well essentially especially since our PBAC goal isn't reached it's you know this plan would be one that um, it's certainly worthwhile to do because it will help reduce our pressure on our already declining aquifer right. it's certainly not the solution to our, our water problems I mean looking at um, our PBAC goal and um, not knowing how much water is in the aquifer it, it would be safe to say that we can't, cons you know, we may not be able to conserve our way out of our problem, but it certainly is something that would help reduce the pressure on the aquifer, give sure. us some more time to find these solutions that we need. Um, you know, and essentially new infrastructure is a, a costly thing as well, so it could theoretically delay that again these are all guesses and you know based on an aquifer that we know is declining we're not sure how or where it regenerates how is this lack of snowpack affecting it um, there's all of these questions that not from lack of research but we all know that those answers are not a hundred percent well it just brings up the bigger bigger issue from a planning standpoint and even as you look at the world you know we're not in a part of the world where we irrigate very little except for our lawns we don't we don't do irrigation but if you are in a world that does irrigation then agriculture uses 90% more water than than people uh, municipal uh, people would do and so the dialogue in Boise is way different than the dialogue here mm -hmm. since we have this just this limited resource but there the Farmers are, you know, if they let the water run all night long and blah blah blah. It's a, uh, if you think of the broader world of, and and who's at the end of the Snake River, and then who's at the end of the Columbia River. Okay. But uh, it's very nice. Thanks for your. Mm -hmm. Have you been out selling this in? Uh, you said at the uh, public uh, input. I, I've been sitting around. I never. Uh, I guess I didn't pay attention. I'm sorry. Um, council workshop, and it was just waiting to get the feedback, and that's the next step. I need to um, meet up with all my superiors, and we're going to go through the list and and start considering all of the comments and edits that were sent in. I haven't seen them yet. Again, it ended. It closed on Friday. How did you get the public input? I was asking. Oh, um, they 
sent out a press release and I believe people, I know some people emailed me and I forwarded those emails, but I think a lot of people emailed. I, I don't know because I wasn't collecting them. Judy Davis was collecting all the public comments, so I'm not sure. How was the PVAC um, ceiling arrived at? That was arrived from a five-year moving average. And I'm, uh, 1980, okay, there's two clumps of time in there, and I think the ceiling was 81 to 85, and the other 1% was um, 86 to 90. I might have them backwards, but mm -hmm. from a five-year moving average in that time, in that time frame. Don't quote me on that, but it's right around in there. So they had, they had their that five-year moving average, and they based it on that. Is my understanding for the city of Moscow? And, and 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 as I understand, it was the best science of the day guessed that mm -hmm. perhaps things would stabilize at that ceiling. At, right, mm -hmm. and and then the political process picked a number. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the good news is. The 875 is a political number. <laughs> Nothing breaks when we go above it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. our, our partners may break, but, but mm -hmm. we don't immediately run out of water if we cross through that boundary. Whereas if air starts coming up through the pumps, mm -hmm. the, the game is very, very different. Mm -hmm. And the other good news is groundwater declines have decelerated mm -hmm. yes. in the last Three to four um, years? Since 06, we see it at um, 0.6, 6 tenths of a foot. So bef um, historically, it was one and a half <coughs> feet per year. And then the groundwater management plan was 1992. And right about there, we started to see the decline at 9 tenths of a foot. And more recently, it's been 6 tenths of a foot. So we are seeing um, good news and when it comes to that. The, the more we depress the basin, the m maybe we start to find where the equilibrium point is. <laughs> And just one more question. Um, uh, is there information available for folks, you know, common folks, <laughs> about how much it costs you to flush your toilet? Yeah, you talk to me. Yeah. I, I, I just wondered numbers. about... Um, <laughs> you know, That's what I do, half yeah, part of my yeah. day. <laughs> Disseminating that information in some sort of... Uh, like if you had a sign above your toilet right. that said, <laughs> every time you flush this, it, it, That's it right. costs... That's right. <laughs> I like that one. Put a jar on Five. top of the toilet. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, uh, I mean, just Here's another way of looking, yeah. you know, how much can you save on your bill? If you that's know, not That's not a bad idea. I will I will add our water in Moscow is quite economical. We have of our base rate, no matter how much water you pump, that everybody pays to mm -hmm. be tied into the system, and beyond that, our water is, is, is mm -hmm. you know, we're billing people on by 100 cubic feet. There is that tiered right. billing rate, but you're yeah. you're only looking for a, you know a couple bucks for 100 mm -hmm. cubic feet. Mm -hmm. That's 748 <laughs> gallons. Yeah. So we really are an yeah. economical water source. So, right. from my outreach perspective, it is a little harder to have that. Um, you know, a message like that really yeah. um, hit a, you know, mm -hmm. hit where it hurts because it really doesn't hurt a whole lot financially. Now, when right. you're looking at doing your lawn, right. those are numbers that I do show because mm -hmm. I have a Yscape. I compare how much, um, I actually measure how much water the water department puts on their Yscape. I have my, it has its own meter and I can show people this is what it, you know, it would cost you mm -hmm. if you had this. This is what it would cost you if you had a lawn. Mm -hmm. So that one is pretty... You know, mm -hmm. that shows a big difference in cost. We're mm -hmm. talking $6 up to $200 for the irrigation season. So mm -hmm. that's one, that's a number that really helps mm -hmm. make a point. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, mm -hmm. Nicole, for mm -hmm. making the time this evening. Great. Thank you. And uh, for Thank the you. questions that you stimulated. Uh, next up, Camden Court PUD minor amendment request. Rebecca is batching on this one. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So for your review tonight, we have a um, request for a minor PUD amendment at the Camden, Camden Court Plan Unit Development. So some of you may recall this was brought to you last month. Um, a minor amendment for Camden Court, and I'm going to do just a real quick background just so everyone refreshes where this is at, um, and then I'll get into the, the details of tonight's request. 
So the Camden, Camden Court PUD was approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission on October 2005. It's a 13-unit single-family residential development, and it's located at the intersection of White Avenue and Wiltshire Drive. At the time that the PUD plan was approved, the subdivision plot was also approved, and it included 13 lots uh, ranging in size from 5,095 to 7,306 square feet with an approximate 10,000 square foot stormwater detention pond and a 28 foot wide private access drive. Six of the 13 dwelling units face White Avenue and seven of them, seven of the lots that are currently not developed yet face um, Cam Camden Drive. And the stormwater detention pond functions as the required landscaped open space area for the PUD. Eight of the 13 homes have already been constructed. So here is where we're at, White Avenue here and Wiltshire Drive, and then the development is outlined in yellow. So this aerial is a couple years old. Um, these ones are all developed today, and this one is nearly completed, and these four are not developed. This site here is the location of the stormwater detention pond. This is the approved PUD plan showing the proposed building footprints and the landscape plan and then this is the private access drive um, Camden Camden Court that comes in off of Wiltshire and then um, heads back out onto Wiltshire towards the south. These are some of the schematic design concepts that were submitted at the time of the PUD approval. Um, they show the architectural character of the homes that are to be to be built there. And these are the homes today that face White Avenue. This is, this home here is on the corner of White Avenue and Wiltshire Drive, and so this is looking up that private drive, Camden Court. This is looking at the stormwater detention pond area, and then the drive that comes around and back out to Wiltshire. And this is looking at the subject property um, which, like I said, these four lots right here are all currently undeveloped. So, as I mentioned, you're familiar with this uh, development because just last month it came before the commission a request for a minor amendment, So, th and that was approved on July 8th. That was regarding lot number 13, which is the same lot that's under review tonight. And just a reminder of what the previous request was, the developer was requesting um, orientation of the building to be shifted from Camden Drive to Wiltshire Drive so that the, the garage would face Wiltshire and the primary home entrance would front Wiltshire but also have a front facade on, on Camden Drive. The house that was proposed was, was still going to be consistent with the style and the theme of the development and the scale and the massing were to be similar to what was portrayed and constructed. And the orientation of the home was, was going to be a benefit in that it would allow transition from Camden Drive houses to the ones constructed on Wiltshire Drive that are outside of this development. So again, this is the lot that's under review, lot 13. So when um, early communications began with the applicant for the previous amendment that you approved in July, we received a, a site plan that looked like this. It showed, this is lot 13 here, and it showed a 10 foot rear yard setback where the requirement is 20. And it also showed the change in the orientation with Wiltshire Drive out here, north is facing to the left of your screen. And initially, staff communicated to the applicant that they would need to submit a request for a minor PUD amendment to allow for that reduced rear yard setback from 20 to the 10 feet. When the PUD amendment was submitted, there was some mishap um, with the site plan that came in from the applicant, and we received this site plan, which was the one that came before you for review showing a 20-foot rear yard setback, which then pushed the house up to the front and no longer, there was no longer a front yard setback. So there was a little bit of a miscommunication or an error on some part and 
um, eliminated the required 10-foot front set setback, which was inadvertently approved by the commission last month. So um, the request that was then submitted, it, it did address, it, it only addressed the modification of the orientation of the building, and it didn't speak to um, any setback reduction. So therefore, uh, well then after the um, approval, the commission's approval of the amendment, the applicant went back to the drawing board with the potential home buyer and realized that they wanted to in fact reduce that rear yard setback. So they came to the community development department and requested that. And we realized what had happened and um, that initially the applicant desired to actually reduce that rear yard setback in, in order to have some yard area in the front yard. So the request tonight is to reduce the minimum front, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So the request tonight again is for that same lot number 13 to request to reduce the rear yard setback from 20 feet to 10 feet. Um, doing this would more suitably accommodate the orientation of the garage driveway off Wiltshire Drive and it still allows for an entry into the living area of the home from the Camden Court sidewalk. The house would still be consistent with the style and the theme of the development as previously proposed, and the scale and the massing will still be similar to what has been portrayed and constructed in the development. This is, again, the approved PUD plan showing the lot line for the subject property. As you can see, it goes out, it extends to include that private drive area, and so here is the, the um, submitted site plan for the current request. And this is that property line that goes out to the other side of the private drive. And so it shows a 35 foot measurement there. This line here is essentially at just beyond the back edge of the sidewalk. So now they are showing an 11 foot setback here and just shy of 10 feet here. The required front setback is 10 and a Architectural features that do not provide indoor floor space are permitted to project into front yard setbacks up to 48 inches. So a reduction, so um, that that small amount of less than a foot is permissible within the front yard setback. And then it shows the reduced 10 foot setback in the rear. And then again, it's still consistent out here with the drive off of Wiltshire and the required setbacks on that side. So with the review of a minor PUD amendment, there are several items that are considered. Um, the request is not to meet any of these. If it meets any of these requirements, then staff would direct the applicant to apply for a major PUD amendment, which is essentially the same process that they go through to um, get a PUD approved. So the ones that are related to this request are um, the substantially change the bulk or clustering of, of buildings and the visual impact or the theme of the development and we don't feel that this request substantially changes any of those things and the other one that is related is substantially change the location of uses or the layout of lots, streets, trails, or pathways and we don't feel that again this request substantially changes that. So therefore, staff has reviewed the proposed amendment and determined that it doesn't substantially alter the bulk or clustering of the buildings or visual impact, nor does it substantially change the location of uses or layout of lots for the proposed development. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the Camden Court Minor PUD amendment. Questions? Um, was there, were there any comments from the property owner that is now where it's going to be squeezed another? 10 feet, any concerns from, from that property owner? There were no comments received. Okay. And are, are setbacks usually like up for negotiation in, in, in PUDs? They can alter from what's required yeah. by the zoning code in, in, in the regular zone. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does switching the orientation from Camden Court to Wilshire change where the rear yard is? No, it doesn't. This this still remains the rear yard. 
on a corner lot, it can, you can. The, the developer can call the rear yard. Right, or the, or the zoning administrator or when we look at the plans. Can yeah. determine that can that's determine the rear. Yeah, as long as the, there just needs to be a rear and a front, mm -hmm. and in this case, it, it stays the same. So the address of the house is not Wilshire, but. Um, well, it's really it's still Camden Court, isn't it? Camden I think Court. it would still be Camden Court. Yeah. Yeah. Porch, the, that Seems point. like it, but it, it, it's the oh. columns are not there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, corners raise interesting problems. Yeah. Other, other questions, comments? I was also wondering about the neighbor, if the neighbor knew yeah. or that, that this change might come. Well, it wasn't, it's not a public phone. Minor so minutes are not, it's not a notice. A notice public hearing, so notice is not provided to adjacent okay. property owners. If the home is actually truly facing uh, Wilshire, the side CR setback minimum is only five feet mm -hmm. on that side. There's an existing four foot retaining wall. The home sits up another uh, three or four feet above that, so it's really not you know, encroaching. It's really this lot sits below, and there's some vertical separation there as well. I would entertain a motion to approve the minor PUD amendment, or is it to recommend? We just approve it. Mm -hmm. okay. To approve the minor PUD amendment. Yep. We make the motion. Kurt, motion. Okay. Second. I'll second. Rob. Any other discussion? All in favor of approving the minor PUD amendment on Camden Court, say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstain. There you go. Thank you. Right. Thank you. All right, next up, approval of recent statement of relevant criteria and standards. You will require, or you will recall two weeks ago, we held a public hearing on Harvest Hills first edition and we struggled. I had a split decision and um, came out in opposition to the proposed plan. So now, and then we asked staff to uh, write up the reason statement. Um, and I have thought on more than one occasion that um, Mike had a tough job for the last two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so there are three of them. I take it, Bill, that we need to <clears throat> do three actions to approve each one of the reason statements? It seems like we've got two copies uh, of the comp plan in here. There should be only be three, comp plan, rezone, and subdivision. My packet had three distinct. Maybe I just was lucky and got an extra. You got a bonus. <laughs> there were several things that I, starting with the comp plan one, just mechanical things. Yes. The lower left it is has a footer that says Indian Hills 6. We can correct that. Um, so yes, I'd recommend just doing an order from comp plan rezone to subdivision plan okay. for the three relevant criteria. Um, so any comments or thoughts about the comp plan one? On uh, page 204, another clerical issue, item 13, has a public hearing on January 22 of 2015. I think that's July. Um, the, the bigger thought that I had was, I think we created a bit of a pickle here, historically, when we painted that vacant land as neighborhood conservation that became one of the struggles then that we had in our mm -hmm. decision making. Uh, had that been put in some other category, it might have been a different picture for us. Because it's not a neighborhood to conserve. It's just a Yeah, I think field. at the time we had the Windfall Hill subdivision plat that had been ah. somewhat approved and, and I think that was that was treated as pseudo developed, platted mm -hmm. and okay. approved. The plat never and that was right about the time we were doing the comp plan update. It never really reached final recordation stage. We reached preliminary plat approval and final plat approval and all the way up to just needing to record the plat of the county. 
uh, and the applicant was, did not do that, and so that plat did expire. I think it was probably an oversight or error of viewing that as kind of o as part of the overall already platted and planned and for development area at the time. And on the scale of the map you're working with, it's this little narrow sliver that I think probably just kind of right, just got painted. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. And those are just kind of general broad determinations of one of those. I, well, I was looking at the comp plan map this afternoon on that, and if you look. I mean, it, it is surrounded by neighborhood conservation all around it. So it, it seemed to me logical that that continued to be a part of that broader broader area. So I, 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 kind of, I was puzzled yeah. about the, the same thing. So I kind of went back to look to say, okay, what, what have we got here? But it, it was consistent with what we were talking about two weeks ago. And the surrounding areas all were a part of the neighborhood conservation area. Yeah, if the property were viewed as undeveloped, no proposals, no plat approved on it, we would have probably designated it as auto urban residential, just be consistent of what we would anticipate that to be developed in, in the future, and would not have put it into a conservation designation because that assumes existing developed condition. Mm -hmm. okay. And so we would have designated it differently. Um, but I think at the time it was. Anticipated it was on the final stages of the plat approval, and by the time this got adopted, that would you know it would be platted, mm -hmm. and so rather than rather than coloring it a different color because it's interim and it hadn't been final recorded, I think it just got encompassed in the broader area <laughs> designation. Painted gray. I also found reading this interesting relative to the conversation we've started to have about. Um, the reason state the, the criteria for the reason mm -hmm. statements themselves because um, because it was a challenging one to to write the findings on on um, number under relevant criteria so I'm on page three number five the, I'm towards the end of that little paragraph the proposed amendment would create issues with on-street parking nuisances and an increase in traffic to the area. On a comp plan change, are those appropriate considerations? I particularly, I focused on on-street mm -hmm. parking. It, it seems that we don't know what the parking is like right. in a comp plan change. And I don't mean to be going to say, we had a split vote and I was on the losing side. I'm not trying to be grumpy <laughs> about it tonight. But it's a good I'm point. trying to use this as a chance to sharpen all our thinking mm -hmm. a little bit and and that just stood out as me, hmm, is that a comp plan issue? So, mm -hmm. so traditionally on a land use designation, you would be looking towards the potential allowable uses underneath the matching zoning designation for that land use designation you would not be getting to the level of detail of on-street parking discussion. Um, you could talk about increased traffic, you know, because it's it's a commercial introduction and people may be coming and leaving, visiting the site to frequent the commercial services. Parking would not necessarily be something that you're probably going to be at the level of detail for a comp plan designation. It would not generally include nuisances because in a broad sense, what kind of nuisances do you really think it's going to create? Traffic is just traffic. Um, nuisances tend to imply something more detrimental. And on a land use designation, I don't know that you could really point to, at that stage, that you could identify there's going to be a nuisance. Now, you could say that there has a potential for conflicting incompatible land uses, um, but I think I would be a little careful about getting so specific to say you can predict that there will be a nuisance that will occur or that parking is going to be an issue at the comp plan level. So, um, you know, I think if you were, if you were to, um, you would might say that, that the, um, so the micro growth of the process of cost for issues for people in the community, um, I would probably have a more broad statement that says, however, the proposed amendments um, 
and again, this is the commission's opinion, the commission's decision, but it may could be posed in terms of um, would create the opportunity to create incompatible uses or something more general, whatever the commission felt was the conflict here. Um, and again, you don't have to find fault in every one of these criteria. That's the other thing. I mean, if you think that there could have been a benefit to the public, but there were unmitigable impacts, then that can be the basis for a denial. So you could, you know, you could have that statement to where it's um, the proposed destination. You know, it, it starts off the commission finds proposed designations would have an impact on the surrounding single family residential neighborhood. Um, although the proposed designation could possibly allow for commercial uses and different housing types, which would be good to the community, the location of these incompatible land uses, you know, are, is not in harmony with the neighborhood or something kind of in more general terms. I probably would not get into a specific discussion of nuisances and off-street parking. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's a question I'd put to the commission. Do you want to do a little wordsmithing here? Yeah. I guess my suggestion would be that the uh, reference to on-street parking um, be deleted there. So uh, on-street parking is is it does uh, get addressed is, further is referenced down. later mm -hmm. in the uh, um, preliminary subdivision plat uh, item six. So uh, uh, it's covered, and I think it could be deleted here. Okay. I think I heard you talking about incompatible uses. So I would propose you think about changing that so that the approach to read the end of that sentence, the proposed amendment would create incompatible uses and an increase in traffic. Would or could? Yeah. Uh, I would say could. Could. Yeah. Yeah. Could create incompatible uses and an increase in traffic. Yeah. I'll buy that. So I think that was a, a cent to that mm -hmm. amendment. Yeah. Okay. That, that was the thing that stuck out to me. Um, I, I was asking myself, again, this question that I posed to you two weeks ago, how does Moscow decide to densify? I'm not sure I've gotten the answer <laughs> <laughs> to that question. <laughs> but anyway, but well, using that lens, then I'm finding, sort of nitpicked a little bit on that. Uh, other comments or thoughts? I'd entertain a motion to approve these, if not. I just was going to say that generally reading the minutes, it looked like the, the classic balancing act between densification and, and people wanting their neighborhood to stay the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how you, you know, it, it, there, it's, it could have been right either way, yeah. but it's just always such a tough juggling act to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And up above, there wasn't an argument of a real change in market demand, population need. Maybe the applicant didn't make that argument uh, that could have been made, but um, it didn't come across in what's, what's in the minutes or in my memory of the event. Yeah. All right, I'd entertain a motion to approve the uh, reason statement for the comp plan amendment. So moved. Joel, thank you. Is there a second? Kurt. Kurt. I have a question. Question, Deb. The three of us who were not here for all of the information are only getting it second hand. So in my mind, for me, I don't feel like it's, and I want to vote yay or nay because I wasn't here to hear the whole thing. You so can is abstain. That appropriate? You can abstain. Is that appropriate though? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Appropriate, not required. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right, with that clarification. You should have been here. The <laughs> 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 first good one. You missed a good yeah. time. That's right. It was a harsh, it was a, it, An interesting it, it gets to the heart of some of the issues that we uh, deal with as, as a city. I wasn't expands. being coward cowardly, though. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was Martin's birthday. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, you would have, 
we would have liked to have had a uh, uh, everybody on the uh, on the commission. It was a uh, uh, one of our uh, harder decisions. I I, I tried not to say it, but boy, on the no side, we sure had the odd couple. <laughs> <laughs> Politics makes drink. <laughs> At any rate, with that, we have a motion, a second, and a clarification procedurally. All in favor of approving the uh, reason statement, say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? Deb? And Greg. And Greg. Okay. That's one down. Um, the second one is the rezone, and that has a wrong date in the lower left-hand corner, but I think it has the right title. Are there comments no, was about it Harvest Hills or Windfall Hills? Oh, Harvest Hills. Uh, Harvest is hard. <coughs> Windfalls was the was the prior name. Previous name. Previous name. Previous name. So many, so many this <laughs> yes. hills and that hills. <laughs> Inside <laughs> hills. Harvest Hills. Right. It is the place. And this is the rezone. So this is saying not what the street alignment is, but what the land uses are. So again, in number four of the relevant criterion standards, um, where it references on-street parking, now we're talking about <clears throat> density. As you get into the zoning, I think that now becomes on-street parking may not, you know, right, be but specific <coughs> um, traffic. Traffic definitely, yeah. Right, so I'm just questioning the on-street parking presence in a. And again, um, nuisance is another one that I, I'm always hesitant to use that term in predicting something you know, will be create a nuisance. So it could be, uh, would unduly burden Jason neighborhoods with additional traffic, traffic period. and incompatible, and potentially incompatible uses if you wanted to, or just additional traffic, you can leave it at that. Rob, I heard you say just leave it. So oh, I did. Yeah, I, neighborhoods I with additional traffic period. Is yeah. that where you were? Okay. And and I had a question about the third one because I don't recall us discussing a concern related to private gain. Uh, maybe maybe we did, but I didn't remember talking about it, that we were there, concerned about. I didn't remember that, that coming up yes. either. Yeah. There was some discussion. I'm not really but sure if it. Had Tended one way or the other. <laughs> the, the spot zoning phrase got used. I recall that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you're looking at the last sentence. The commission is concerned that the proposed rezone may be directly related to private gain yeah, and I, not in the best interest of adjacent neighborhoods. I think the latter part was probably a part of the discussion, but I, I sure don't remember being concerned about private gain. That's okay. So you might I, want to say, oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry? It's in the minutes, too. Mike oh. mentioned it in relation. Somebody asked what's the definition of spot zoning, legal spot zoning. Oh, and it was for private gain. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember the spot zone discussion. So you could do the inverse of that. You, could, If you want to possibly say the rezoning may not serve the general public interest and not in, It'd be in the best interest of adjacent neighborhoods, if you wanted to not present it in terms of private gain but not in the general public interest, if that was the concern. So one option would be to just strike the private gain yeah. phrase proposed reasoning may not be in the interest of the adjacent neighborhoods. Let's just strike that private gain phrase altogether. Or, as Bill is suggesting, may not be in the general public interest. You leave a period of that. 
Mm -hmm. Thoughts? It struck me as the best interest of the adjacent neighborhood is a pretty high bar if we were ever going to right. be. Well, the dilemma, you know, we talked about the fact that the, the I, it wasn't presented as well as it might have been presented, but the, the I mean, we've uh, seen a great deal of development. We talked about this out on White Avenue that are very similar, but people knew what they were buying there. And the, the dilemma that we're facing is that you've got a surrounding neighborhood that bought many years ago and now in a sense, we're giving them the White Avenue treatment, and they're not ready for it. Mm -hmm. Even well, though White I'm Avenue is just in. fine. Yeah, and and so uh, you know that's I think that's a thing that gnaws at uh, made it uh, so hard to make a, d a decision because. Under another circumstance, you just it's hard to to define what you know. You've been here in the neighborhood. It's like the folks on the edge of town who have been listening to the meadowlark sing all these years, and then it gets developed, Duh. and they don't want it. They want to hear the meadowlark forever, and it, it can't be. Mm. But but so this change is. Uh, and it's perceived as something. Uh, perhaps it was that. more. Uh, perhaps uh, the the neighbors mm -hmm. perceived it in a more strong way than anybody at our in the commission would have perceived it. Mm -hmm. And being such a narrow sliver, it's harder to work with. I'm thinking of in contrast to Indian Hill Six where the neighbors up on the high ground <clears throat> objected, but by making some compromises of R2 up there, R3 lower down, R4 when you get down onto Alturas, whether the neighbors ended up happy or not, at least the commission could say, look, there's a transition and a gradation and we're not banging a high density against a lower density. Mm -hmm. uh, here, unless you can view the vertical separation the vertical. as making the difference there it's such a narrow strip it's hard not to mm -hmm. do that um so go ahead. i was, was going to suggest if you wanted to reward it that the commission is concerned that the proposed rezoning uh, does not serve the general public interest or that of adjacent neighborhoods maybe one way to avoid the calling out the private gain because I, I don't you know that's one that I it's all private gain anyway it right is right well down to it. but I mean, sometimes it's not that much gain it's, a, it's yeah. that's development it's land development it's yeah. a risk and sometimes there's a gain and sometimes there's sometimes, a loss it's, yeah. you know, it's but fun. as we were discussing that the issue about spot zoning I think we all agreed that it wasn't spot zoning and the definition of spot zoning was that it was for private gain and we decided that that wasn't the case, so yeah. I, I think that we pretty much determined that that wasn't yeah, the relevant nice. criteria. Isn't yeah. the wording in there that it's primarily or solely for private gain? Solely for private the bold line, line is the does is not the serve the general public interest yeah. and is solely, essentially, is solely yeah. for private gain. Yeah. And, and here's again where we have one of these criteria that's got multiple elements in it, mm -hmm. and we could fail it on the first phrase without on the second phrase mm -hmm. without in this case so these compound statements have to get broken apart mm -hmm. right <laughs> it's also the case isn't it that as you go through these you might you might find it meets one criteria but not the others and still right. it's so you could four. yeah so you could look at three and say yeah no issue there it's not spot zoning and just but still disapprove well, we still think it's going to be incompatible even though it's not spot zoning mm -hmm. yeah 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 so, Bill, could you give us your 
revised proposed sentence for the last line of three. So it would read, the commission is concerned that the proposed rezoning does not serve the general public interest or that of adjacent neighborhoods, if you wanted to capture those two thoughts. Folks okay with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then in four, on-street parking, is that still something that we might, and then a period after additional traffic? My only question. Unduly burdened neighborhoods. With the the traffic language is it, it is a property that's bordered by an arterial with a collector through the middle of it. And it's not, the area of intensification is not directly connected to any other neighborhoods. I mean, it will in the future connect in the back, but it's not like this is driving traffic through a neighborhood to gain access to it. So the traffic question is a bit of a one that I think you may want to think about approaching it in a different way because I, it's a difficult case to say, well, it's adding traffic on Mountain View. Well, everything that develops up and down on the east side of Mountain View is going to be contributing to traffic. That's not unique to this. And it is an arterial and it is a collector. Those are, you know, high capacity streets that are intended to have higher volumes. Um, and it's a concentration directly adjacent to that arterial. So that, you know, again, it's not leading, it's not at the other end of 6th Street where it's going to be drawing people through 6th through the Rolling Hills edition and causing traffic in the existing neighborhoods, it's going to be somewhat contained and isolated on the edge and disconnected mm -hmm. from Damon and that. So it may be the incompatible uses may, we want to try to emphasize that maybe more so than just traffic along. If that was the, and I, again, I wasn't here that evening, but. Um, it almost sounds to me like, yeah. like there is no, uh, there's nothing about number four that that they that, that can be said negative to that really well, and truly I mean, what, is, what kind of a burden is it putting on the neighborhood in the, on the neighborhood yeah yeah well so some the of burden? the object when I reread the minutes some of the objections that folk, people who were really talking about traffic were the people who live on Mountain View north and south of it who have a driveway situation where they have to get out onto Mountain View and it has been an increasingly bad problem for them for a number of years and yeah this will add something more to their already bad situation. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen well, the next 20 acres there. that develops. Uh, that well, it's hard, hard, to, hard to see how we can do this in number four. It's kind of hard to, to see don't you? Even if we I mean, people will say that uh, even if we just had individual homes here and reduced uh, a, a few cars, still... Um, Anything that gets yeah, built there uh, is going to put traffic on. Yes. As we develop, we get more uh, cars. And so, if we just maybe said the proposed zoning and uses would not unduly burden adjacent neighborhoods, period. In other words, flip the meaning of the sentence around. And I think I'd probably include the public infrastructure or environmental resources if, if the commission agrees with that. So you're covering all the topics um, there. Because, okay, right. The, yeah. the neighborhood, comma, the public infrastructure or the environment. We reviewed with Mike that there is a <clears throat> pinch point in the sewer downstream, but that it's on the plan to be remediated. Right. Uh, one of the neighbors raised the issue of water. And we have an ongoing issue of water, but we're not at a point of saying we stop development because of water. Mm -hmm. So the it, okay. So I'm going to propose we change it to the proposed zoning and uses would not unduly burden adjacent neighborhoods, public infrastructure, or environmental resources. So this one comes out in the positive. In total, we're still yeah, going to reject I think, it. Uh, I think we need to do that. Yeah. And you can clearly yeah. say it's not in conformance with the comp plan because the comp plan got denied. Right. It's the uses present potential incompatible impacts, which you already covered number two. Um, if you don't think it's in the general interest, in three, that's covered. That's more than enough to support the denial and still have four be right. Right. And not, and not be seen as being too far out over there yes. on that. Okay, so are you acceptable with that revision to number four? Yes. 
Yeah. And Shandy, feel confident you have it. Okay. So with those, in the other discussion, or we'll vote on, uh, oh, no, I'll entertain a motion to approve the revised uh, reason statement for the reason. So moved. Rob, thank you. Second. Thank you, Nels. All right, with that, uh, we'll vote on the revised statement. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Deb and Gregory. Thank you. I have a generic sort of question. Mm -hmm. So, what's the person owning the property and wanting to develop it left available to do? Build something that is more in keeping with what is already in Roman Meals? So the property is already zoned R2. Larger, so larger lots. They can mm -hmm. just plat it to the 7,000 square foot minimum lot size in the R2 okay. district. Um, and they have a version of that that you know, has been approved, okay. and but they didn't, you know, it expired, and that was because of a, a question of balancing the cost and the yield on the development because of the wider collector street and the requirement for the Austrian parking. So they could come back with another plat of that character. Um, I think they have indicated they have a desire to continue on to the council, even though the commission did recommend denial. I think they still may wish to proceed to the council and and have the council consider their request. But they have another plan on the drawing board. They have an old well, we've seen another back. plan. Well, but these aren't the same people. It's the same, 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 oh, it's it's the same party. Yeah, the same oh. party that did the, the previous harvest tools oh, okay. that was approved. Okay. Same same developer. It just, they did not feel that the project as approved okay. with the conditions of the council was, the was financially viable, okay. which led them to this different option. Um, so I think the first option they have available is to pursue this proposal onto the council. Um, and the second option is to go back and revisit, revise, do okay. something, do something different. The property is still zoned R2 after this action, and so they still have an option of looking at if there's another way that they can help mitigate some of that cost of the project or try to somehow improve the lot yield or the return on the project to make it financially viable. So they're not precluded from something, right? I knew though that. it may or may not pencil very well, right? Yeah. Or maybe phasing would change how it pens. It could. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a whole host of options. But I, I think early indications were they wanted to continue with this onto the council and this will move, move forward. One suspects that the, uh, the neighbors, you know, who were aware of the presentation a year or two or three ago, presumed that's what it was going to be. And then as it shifted, right. it, it uh, worried them. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a difficult uh, decision uh, to make, and, and since we were split on it, it was it's caused us to uh, think uh, more, um, to, to give more consideration to this issue uh, uh, than we might have if it was just a unanimous. So, uh, so I think it was troubling uh, for all of us. It, it, it was a bit of a, a difficult decision, yes. So we've got the last thing now, huh? We're down to the last one, yes. Um, in the, down in the footer, it says Harvest Hills PP uh, to help you identify as a preliminary plat. Um, on this one, number six, other, I think that was one of the really important thoughts is the struggle to have Third Street, which is not having on-street parking and Wendy I think was point I'm pointing at Deb but it was Wendy beside me at the last meeting backing maneuvers out onto that it just seemed like there were some real traffic conflict potentials on in that design that was presented to us So I was, I'm praising the number six other being here. Yeah. I don't know how you solve it, but. <laughs> that was a major part of that conversation when he first, wasn't it? It, it was, and there was a requirement that farther, as you get further up, as you make the corner and get down this straight stretch of third, that on street parking would be required to be added. So the roadway would have to be widened by eight or nine feet mm -hmm. to add that additional on street parking. In this area, it's kind of difficult to do because of proximity to the Mountain View intersection, and so you're you're likely going to have driveways. You know, whether it's 
twin homes or single family dwellings that will be backing onto the street. And, you know, it's going to be that they will have to make sure they park in the garage and keep the driveway available for guests because that's just where they live and they don't have on-street parking there. And there are those situations that do occur in town where there are some streets that on-street parking is not allowed and you just have to make other accommodations um, for your guests to park somewhere or talk to your neighbor and see if you can have your guests park in their driveway if they're not using a space. It's just there's, there's no solution to that situation. Um, other than potentially adding that on street parking, but it can only get carried really so far before you get so close to the intersection that you can't really carry it any longer. And you're fighting some topography on that north side as well as you're coming around that corner. So it, it's just a difficult, it is a challenging property. Uh, other comments, corrections? I'd entertain a motion to approve the reason statement on the preliminary plat. Thank you, Nels. Second? Okay, Rob. Rob's in. <laughs> All right. But with that, unless there are other comments, all in favor of approving the reason statement say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> and abstentions? Same two. All right. Thank you. And thank you for a careful that. read through that and attention to the sort of complexities of both the situation and the instrument that we're using, which I think is raising some challenges. Uh, we are up to number nine, the shared readings discussion. Uh, you may recall that there were three articles. One was a study out of Canada on street trees and health of the people in the community. One was um, a list of the benefits of urban street trees, a variety of kinds of benefits, uh, not so focused on health. And then the third was just a sample of what a street tree planting guide might look like from a city who's taken a much more nuanced approach to the character of different streets and the trees that should be on those streets compared to our current street tree planting guide. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. sort, sort of felt like this was preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to look for, for something, well, what do we discuss? This all sounds really great. We need, you know, we need trees. I remember looking at a, I don't know where I saw this recently, but a picture of downtown Moscow, probably back in the 50s. It's just, it's just, asphalt jungle all the way down and mm -hmm. the, the stark contrast looking between what that was like and what it looks like now was 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 pretty amazing and it's so much more attractive now mm -hmm. I thought the um, one of the compelling reasons that the, the 22 reasons thing was just the uh, it invites people in it's a, it's just a much more inviting inviting area people can come down and enjoy um, dinner on the sidewalk and coffee and things like that. So I think it's the, the placemaking and the, and the commercial, I thought, were really compelling reasons to, mm -hmm. for that. And you'll recall the origin of this. Um, it, the large origin is, is the city is working through revising the zoning code. And the smaller, that there's street tree planting requirements in current subdivisions the fund is not being spent. The perception is it's not, the mechanism is not working, and so there's a request to think about a new mechanism. And in the opening of that conversation, then commissioners asked, could we have some readings on the benefits of street trees? Um, what I saw in these was, well, that makes writing the whereas section um, <laughs> what we're going to do easy. <laughs> because they really focus not on trees backyard trees or trees in general but these were street trees and mm -hmm. urban values like mm -hmm. traffic safety and commercial mm -hmm. advantage and health of residents mm -hmm. um, that I think are going to make that conversation a lot stronger mm -hmm. um, when we go to writing the whereas statement. Mm -hmm. One of the little things that I I don't think many people would make the mistake of, but we, I happen to live in a 
Doug Fir Forest that is not a, which I, I love, but it's not uh, a kind of tree that you would want to be planting in your on your streets. And I think it's real <laughs> helpful. We've had now three three of the tree three of the Doug uh, fir trees in, in the planting strip got so big that they've blown over. So we've had three on my block. Uh, blown over because they are not the kind of tree that you would want on a, on a street. So I think one of the things that is important is that um, to have a tree commission and to have guidelines for the kinds of trees that should be planted may just seem obvious. But we've uh, we've left a stump, and I haven't put the uh, you know the last one of ours that w went over. We're gonna put a plaque on it and try to talk about the fact that mm -hmm. you know uh, the evergreen tree doesn't have a tap root, and it uh, grows mm -hmm. uh, its uh, its roots are close to the uh, top of the soil. So when you put in the curb, mm -hmm. you cut that. Uh, root and uh, sure and three of those big uh, 80 foot trees have all fallen over mm -hmm. and luckily no one was killed mm -hmm. but it's a it's a uh, so that's a little part I mean we I think we like trees were one of the intriguing planted? what were yours planted or, or were they there when the house was built? Oh, they were planted. Uh, but no tree was in, in okay. Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, okay. no a few scrubby little bushes along Long uh, Paradise Creek. Creek. But basically, uh, there was no tree. That's one of the things that uh, I've enjoyed telling my students over time, is no tree on the campus. There was no tree on the campus when it was started in 1889. Mm -hmm. And uh, so man, it hasn't always been so bad. We've mm -hmm. actually added a lot. <laughs> good. Yeah. We've made some yeah. good choices along the, uh, along the way. But no, these were planted in, actually they were planted around my house 25 years after the house was built. Mm -hmm. And at some point, somebody went up into the forest and got a bunch of dug firs and brought them down and put them into place because the house is 125 years old but the tree rings we we can never get more than 90 out of the uh, counting the tree rings so mm -hmm. basically it was it was 15 to 20 years after the house was built but and and be, uh, with our little hurricane that we had today mm -hmm. Somehow the gods know where our clump of trees are <laughs> because right they may not be any problem across the street in the park, uh -huh. but our trees are going, you know, not, I now have uh, six or eight hours of cleanup to do just after that little 20 minute uh, deal. And I was actually, uh, I watched the trees in that little hurricane and it was just a little bit uh, scary. Mm -hmm. So well, you do notice the, the different ways that different kinds of trees react in different weather, which is a consideration yeah. when you're when you're deciding what to plant. Mm -hmm. Sure, exactly. And uh, you know, and of course, I was hoping I would die before the trees do. <laughs> somebody else, because when when, when uh, the house was, if you were talking about what downtown looked like. I was here in nineteen. 57, 58, 59, mm -hmm. no one ate on the sidewalk. That would have been, you, <laughs> you would have been laughed out of town in 1957 <laughs> if you'd have thought you could eat on the sidewalk. That was not uh, possible. Is that, you know, that, that raises an interesting point. Is that, is that because that just wasn't a cultural thing back then? If there had been trees downtown, would that have changed that, or people just didn't know? I think it was just a <laughs> cultural thing. This is a farm town. Eating. What do you mean? We didn't eat out. <laughs> we didn't eat out. Not on, just on the sidewalk. It was only a warm restaurant in town in the hotel, you know, and otherwise. And I was just counting up today. When the new restaurant opens, we're going to have eight or nine 
really interesting yeah. restaurants in downtown <laughs> Moscow, which is really a, a delight. But that well, wasn't being the in, case uh, in '58. Wheat country and in agriculture, you you took trees out so you could plant wheat <laughs> and peas, and so the the, the whole attitude was trees they just get in the way. And after 11 hours on the open tractor out in the pea field, the idea of sitting outside on the sidewalk just had to have Yeah. 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 So further to your comment, Nels, the Tree Commission has imagined the street tree planting guide more nuanced like the example that you saw that would both in a wide tree lawn with no overhead lines, envision one right. kind of tree, and in a narrow tree lawn, a different kind of tree, and in an overhead line constricted space, or downtown where there's building facades, different considerations. Mm -hmm. But then also, we have talked about the species diversity in the city's forest. Mm -hmm. And there are recommendations about the amount of diversity that one ought to have mm -hmm. in order to not have the Dutch elm disease or other kind of mm -hmm. lights that then completely mm -hmm. damage a town. Um, and so we've imagined that over time the street tree guide might eliminate certain species or it might start light on maples mm -hmm. because we've got so many mature maples already and try to pick up some other things mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. from a disease standpoint and, uh, mm -hmm. as well as an aesthetic standpoint and then maybe over time that recommendation would shift. Oh, we got a lot of oaks now, let's, and there's an oak disease in the south, let's move away from oak and move towards something else. So I think the thought is that it should be much more nuanced. Yeah, I think that will be really good. I think that uh, when, when we did the um, I think in 81, 82, when, when downtown was rethought, refurbished, there was at least, uh, it, we didn't plant every kind of, uh, uh, everything the same, because Main Street got one kind of tree, and then oaks came on some Sun other street. streets, sycamores came on others, and we still have those sycamores growing. Our sycamores on campus have been so much more, uh, they've been more healthy because they've had more earth to live within some of the downtown mm -hmm. uh, downtown ones. But yeah, that uh, menu of plants that could grow, and I'm thinking I, I really would support being able to understand the kind of tree that could deal with the uh, overhead lines. Mm -hmm. what, what would that be? Something that maybe doesn't grow so high or something that is, um, because we're not going to put our lines underground any Anytime soon. I have thought walking downtown, like who decided to put these trees downtown just because of all the stuff that drops. Mm -hmm. mm, the mess and, is. Uh, <coughs> the honey locusts are kind of a messy one. <laughs> the linden blossoms are real. Oh my gosh, yeah. They stick to your. And people let people dogs fur, your feet, your, you know, you go into a store, you have it all over you. I actually kind of uh, contacted the co-op a couple of times because they had not cleaned their sidewalks off of that uh, stuff like everybody else had. And um, because it is irritating to have that walk on that and have it stick to you and, you know. Well, I think that's uh, why we really do need the tree commission to think yeah, uh, along yeah. thoughts about those because it... Maybe the locusts aren't the best. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I and yet, if you go to Lewiston and see the trees they planted, they got mm -hmm. these gorgeous trees, but they've been so dense mm -hmm. that it's There's no light in downtown. It is strange. It's a strange experience. And so driving I don't think that, that kind of, I, I believe yeah. that the, the light that comes through the uh, locusts are really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the fact that so many little yellow things come <laughs> down on the sidewalk and make you have to sweep yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. It's and it seemed like the articles right. were focused more on kind of downtown, the ur I mean, we call that urban, rather than residential. Um, I mean, we were talking about residential trees. More. So the health benefits one was, was, I guess that was looking across the community broadly, but it was, it talked about 
describe the benefits of a tree neighborhood as as moving to a neighborhood that was mm -hmm. yes that's uh, right. higher property mm -hmm. values or mm -hmm. it was equivalent to a higher income so I think that one was really looking at residential benefits yeah. mm -hmm. um, some of them apply across like the, the yeah. stormwater re retention when we were gone for six years and came back and the first time I drove down pheasant run going to our house with six more years of growth on the trees, it was just so much more appealing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just so yeah. much nicer. Yeah. Well, with the heat, you know, we have the trail right across from our house, but I come in, in town and walk where it's shaded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or in the cemetery, mm -hmm. which is also wonderful. Yeah. But <laughs> the, uh, the one thing about, or, or one of the issues about trees is the Fort Russell district with the trees planted on both sides forms a kind of an architectural landscape mm -hmm. which over the years I've just come to absolutely adore. It isn't the landscape I have because I have all these dug firs mm -hmm. but uh, and many of the ones in Fort Russell are probably there's too many maples mm -hmm. but you get this, this arcade mm -hmm. and then you get the sidewalk, and so you get to walk under that with the houses, and this is, um, it only happens in a few Idaho cities. Mm -hmm. I've been now traveling the state working on this Archipedia project, so I've become really familiar with Pocatello and Idaho Falls and Twin Falls and, and mm -hmm. many places, and only Boise's North End and our Fort Russell have the this elegant mm -hmm. tree um, what you might call uh, arcade mm -hmm. that happens mm -hmm. and, there are and other places in town that would look like that if the trees hadn't been butchered though for the power lines could be mm -hmm. my, my streets one example just like gosh they they would look really good they'd look just like Fort Russell but the centers cut well, out I think and the, then they're sickly and they didn't just, Fort Russell it looks uh, awful I haven't looked, I don't have chapter and verse, but many of the power lines are going down the alleys mm -hmm. rather than on the street. And so mm -hmm. that's a very uh, fortunate it is. Uh, thing. In, in our case, the power lines are down our alley. And so, so how do we make places like, like Logan, where all these maple trees have been tortured, how do we make that look pretty? I mean, as long as the tree's yeah. alive and it's not dangerous, People are going to leave them because it's a horrific expense to take them out, yeah. mm -hmm. and then you can't take them out without replacing them. And so I think the recommendation under the wires would likely be for a relatively shorter tree or a slow-growing tree. It would, but I yeah. think the city needs to help the people that own have those pro trees in the in that curb strip because it's not. No one that I know that lives on our street has lived there long enough to be the one who planted the tree and made the mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now the trees are no good. They're not only they're ugly, but they're diseased, and they can retire, require continual upkeep of a difficult nature. So it's going to be expensive to take them out, mm -hmm. and yet they're required to take them out if they become a hazard. And you have to replace them with something. I just think, as a community, it's our responsibility to help people do that financially. Mm -hmm. Is there an opportunity to collaborate with a VISTA so that, I mean, it would be to their benefit too? I don't know, I'm just... Uh, mm -hmm. For them to take the tree out? Well, work with the community and the neighborhoods to work toward replacing them with trees that are going to work better for them and for the neighborhood. <laughs> I, I don't know, it's just kind of a... So, to build on that, along the Travoy linear strip, Troy Highway on this side and Travoy Way on the other is bike trail and then no, I guess I'm not allowed to call it park. <laughs> <laughs> it's got no, nobody's name associated with it, park. Um, but there's been a, well I've lived there so um, 20 years, a phase-wise effort of a Vista working with the neighbors, the first, because the first time they came in and started whacking, yeah, and the neighborhood was up in arms, and then it was like, okay, here's how we're going to protect our wires, the mm -hmm. big high tension wires going along there. Mm -hmm. We need to do these things, but we don't have to do them all at once, and 
we can do mm -hmm. this and this and this. And so the same might be, okay, we, can't, we don't want to do the whole block, mow everything down at once. We'll take the worst tree out on the block and we'll replace, and there's also a blank spot, let's get a tree in there. And, yeah. and, ne and two years from now, we'll get the next worst tree out. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. well, I'll take that back to the tree, tree Commission. Mm -hmm. Because there's many, many, many streets that are like that. Mm -hmm. One suspects that the Vista would be a more willing to discuss that than DOT, for mm -hmm. instance. We, uh, you know, we will know we're edging toward Nirvana yeah. when we get highway <coughs> people that are, uh, uh, that the word beauty actually yeah. is a word they heard. I think we've taken a couple steps in that direction. Yeah, yeah well, we, we actually we, we know, had some breakthroughs. They just recently. they don't snarl anymore. They just kind of uh, snicker. <laughs> I, well, we had the DOT guy uh, all the time when we were talking about beautiful entries, and Bill was, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I know uh, Walter uh, sort of chaired that uh, committee. But I just watched the, our DOT guy on a regular basis to see how he was <laughs> dealing <laughs> with. Uh, <laughs> could we talk about beauty in the same room, even? <laughs> all right. Any other things for the good of the order? Uh, note that we are not meeting in two weeks on August 26th, so our next meeting will be the second Wednesday in September, which will be after Labor Day. Mm. And maybe come next New Year's, we can sit down and be a little bit more planful about picking a couple of things to skip in the summer so that staff can work around the gaps and that maybe some of us can organize, to the extent you have a discretion on your vacation, organize it around that. Great. All right, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So, I need to talk.